right. We want to welcome everyone here tonight, those of you who are in the congregation and those who are jumping on Facebook Live, those who will watch the replay. What I want to do tonight is go into Psalm 1, the very first psalm. But last week we did, if you recall, Psalm 23. And I want to go back, though, before we get into Psalm 1, and I want to read my paraphrase that I received from Spirit as I was meditating on the 23rd Psalm. I want to read that paraphrase one more time and uh, point to the chart that we have up here. We have right hemisphere representing the Christ mind. We have left hemisphere that represents just mere intellect, reasoning, and logic. And then, as we've taught before, up on the north, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, we have Dan that represents emotions, and on the south, Reuben that represents the physical or the five senses. And our goal is to take the left side, the emotions, the five senses, the intellect, the reason, and the logic, and not live out of that in and of itself. Nothing wrong with it, but not live in and of itself out of intellect, reasoning, logic, five senses, or emotions but yield it to our Christ mind. And when we yield it to the Christ mind, what happens is the left and the right become one. You yield the left, the two become one. Heaven then, the Christ mind, invades earth. Heaven invades earth. And then we are experiencing what the book of Revelation calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're partaking of a super supper right now. Yep. Meaning what? Truths are beginning to come forth and be conceived and quickened within us that show us how that we must have the two joined together and married together. Objectively, they're already one. But we don't want to stop with the objective reality of it. We want to experience the subjective where we really walk in this. I mean, what good is it to be one in Christ? What good is it to know our position in Christ objectively, but never subjectively apply it to our lives to where we walk it out, or we walk in it subjectively. And so that's the goal here, is for us to teach a people how that they can draw out of their own well, rather than waiting for someone else to come along, maybe lay hands on them, and I'm not against that, but we want people, and I think this is the greater works that Jesus said that we would do. These things shall you do in greater. I think the greater works are to teach a people how to draw out of their own well, and then the scripture, physician, heal thyself, is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Rather than having to wait on someone else to, you know, come and help us along the way. That had its day, and I'm, you know, I still think there are some people that need that, but there are a people today that want to experience subjectively all that they have always had and all that they have always been. Yes. Now, in Psalm 23, again, I'm going to read that paraphrase, and as I do, I want to point to this chart, and then we'll get into to Psalm 1. But this is my paraphrase of Psalm 23. 23. Verse 1, the Lord is my Christ mind. See, we're one with the Lord, right? The Lord is my Christ mind, and when I am casting my energy to the right side, as opposed to living from the left, when I cast my energy to the right side, I want for nothing. What becomes my shepherd is my Christ mind. And a shepherd leads and directs. And so my Christ mind, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If we're led by our Christ mind, you see, then we're directed by the Christ mind. The two become one and we're directed by the Christ mind. Verse 2, he, my Christ mind, okay, the right side, is activated through my meditation, which creates the throne. Now certainly God has a throne, but you know what? Individually we create a throne that we rule from. By what? By living out of our Christ mind. So he, my Christ mind, is activated through my meditation, which creates the throne where I rule where the left side is in and of itself. And as I feed from the rich pastures within my Christ mind, he leads me beside still waters of refreshing. Okay, verse 3. This is what restores and replenishes my soul or my heart awareness, the left side and leads me in the paths of righteousness, or the paths of the right side, 
for his name's sake, and we know that name means way, for his way to be experienced within our life. Then verse 4, the paraphrase, even though I'm tempted and challenged by lower thoughts of the left side in and of themselves, and I'm tempted by and challenged by lower desires, which are but a shadow of death. How many know a shadow doesn't have any power? See, which are but a shadow, the lower thoughts are but a shadow of death in and of themselves. I will give it no power by being fearful because I know that the he of my Christ mind is with me, in me, as me. And I know this will work because my rod of discipline and staff of support has always worked in the past. It'll always work. When we draw from our Christ mind as opposed to drawing from what we think or how we reason things out or our logic or our emotions in and of themselves or our five senses in and of themselves, when we draw from that, we're not going to be prosperous. But whenever I understand that the rod of discipline and the staff of support has always worked in the past, then I can know that when I yield this left side and I draw from my Christ mind, it's always going to work. I'm always going to build a throne that I'm going to be ruling from, yes. subjectively. Then verse 5, my Christ mind prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's what the King James says, but my paraphrase is, my Christ mind prepares a table before me in the presence of my left side in and of itself, and my head of my Christ consciousness is anointed until I am full of wisdom and full of understanding. And that's the only thing that flows out of my life. Is my right side or is my Christ mind? It has joined then when we yield this, not get rid of it, not crucify it, not try to make it die, because we need intellect, but we need the Christ mind to be in charge of the intellect and of the reason and the logic and the five senses and the emotions. So with that in mind, I just wanted to kind of go over that just a little bit tonight. Let's go to Psalm 1. As We're going to be in Psalm for a little while, not real long, and then I hope maybe to get into Ecclesiastes a little bit. But what I want us to see is, when you get to Psalm 1, it's interesting because Psalm 23 only had six verses. Guess how many Psalm 1 has? Six verses. And do you know that Psalm 1 is saying the same thing in a different way than the way that Psalm 23 says it? It's saying the same thing, and we'll find that out as we look. But let me just say this as we get into Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is not a command. Now, if you read it on the surface level, read it literally, it may be a command to you. It's an observation. What do I mean by an observation? It is showing you what will take place when you draw from the Christ mind. And you'll see the fruit. And then you can make the decision, I'm going to live out of my Christ mind. So it's an observation. It's not a command, as I command you. It's an observation because you're going to see, as you read Psalm 1, the results of what can take place within your life when you live from the Christ mind. So it's not a command. It's an observation. Now, what is behind the book of Psalms? Life instead of death. Right side instead of left side. That's what you that, that that's what you see, if I can talk. <laughs> that's what you see in the book of Psalms is right side living, not left side living. It's life rather than death. So the person who yields his left side again to the right side joins the two together and he becomes planted. So what is the observation, rather than the command, of Psalm 1, that there is a way that abides and there is fruit that remains, but there is a lower way that people choose that perishes. Not the person perishing. This has got to perish as far as being yielded. That's what perish means as well. It doesn't mean... It doesn't always mean, let me say it this way, perish doesn't, it's not always something bad. Well, you're going to perish, you're going to die. You're going to perish in eternal conscious torment. Perish sometimes means, just simply means, it has to be yielded. It has to be yielded. And then it perishes, what? Into the Christ mind. It perishes into spirit, if you will. That's one of the meanings 
doesn't perish. Now, let's read here, beginning in Psalm 1, verse 1, and it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, one of the things we're going to find out here is there are four main objectives here. Number one is practice. And we're going to see both negative and positive on the practice side. Number two, we're going to see power. Number three, we're going to see purification. And number four, we're going to see permanence. And that's what we all want. We want fruit that remains, right? We want to bear fruit that remains. We don't want to bear fruit that's here today and gone tomorrow. And do you know the left side can bear some fruit? There can be some good fruit from the left side as far as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is concerned. And how many know there are two Greek words for good? One is kalos, another is agathos. One is intrinsic good from the tree of life. The other is a lower good from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the left side can bring you some fruit. Problem is, it's not here to stay. We're after fruit that remains, fruit that stays. So, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. This is the practice on the negative side. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So the first thing that he wants us to know, as it says, the very first word is blessed. You and I are blessed. Ephesians 1, 3 says we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly Christ. 2 Peter 1, 3 says he hath already, from before the foundation, given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, let me give you some meaning of the word blessed. In the Hebrew, because we're in the Old Testament here, the Old Covenant or the Old Testament here, and that was given to us in the Hebrew. So the meaning of blessed in the Hebrew means to walk straight on. It means to signify the happiness or blessedness of someone because their way and motion shows their end and what their rest shall be. In other words, blessedness is the state of knowing your way. So what is our way? Our way is the right side. And what does the right side do? It brings us into rest. Only when we're living from the Christ mind or realm of spirit do we really experience rest. Because we're not trying to figure it out over here on the left side. Not trying to reason. Not trying to live by our intellect. Not trying to live by ego or logic. Not trying to live by five senses. Not trying to live by lower emotions. When we live out of the right side and the two are joined together, we, of all people, are blessed. Blessedness is also knowing that you have confident expectation, which is the meaning of hope. How many know the scripture talks about blessed hope? For example, in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, and I'm not going to have us turn there, but it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that we see what our Father knows about us. What did he tell Jeremiah? He said, Jeremiah, I know the good that I have planned for you, not evil. We're going to talk more about this later on in other sessions. There are some things our Father does not know about us. And it's the evil. It's the negative. Our Father doesn't know sickness about us. If he did, guess what? You'd get sick. Because where focus goes, energy flows. So if someone says, he's omniscient. He knows all things. No, no, not really. He, because of his love, he has chosen to only know the things of the kingdom about us. Amen. Now, I could get off in a whole different <laughs> message there tonight. And we're, we're going to do some teaching on that because, you know, there are some that teach that, you know, you chose sickness or you chose this or that or the other in a negative way. Yeah. Or God knows if you're going to have an automobile accident or, or be in an airplane crash. No, God has not chosen to know those things about us. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing when it comes to the things of the kingdom. Okay? Let me read that scripture to you. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know, K-N-O-W, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. And to give you an expected end. So he does not, our Father does not know anything about us except blessing. And so therefore we can have, because blessedness speaks about blessed hope as well, we can know that our future is secure in him. We can know that our future 
is secure in him. Someone says, well, you know, doesn't the scripture say God declared the end from the beginning? Yes, he did declare the end from the beginning, but only in the things of the kingdom. Hello, are you here? Yeah. Still here. Like I said, we're going to do some teaching on that. Because we have had this idea, and religion has taught us God knows all things. He knows the good, he knows the bad, he knows the evil. And then this one that really gets me sometimes is they'll say that we're to, uh, how does the scripture go, number our days? <laughs> number our days. Sacred cow shoot. Guess what numbers means there, to number your days? It celebrate. means the word celebrate. Yeah. Celebrate your life. It's not, teach us, O oh Lord, to number our days. And people interpret that as, well, God knows the very day you're going to take your last breath. No, he doesn't. He's not about death. He's about life. Yes. Amen. He's chosen not to know these things because of his love for us. So when he declared the end from the beginning, as, as Isaiah wrote, when he declared the end from the beginning, what did he declare for us? Only good. Yep. Only God. Only the kingdom of God. And he's given us a better word producing a better hope. And that's what he was doing with Jeremiah. And a lot of people think, well, you know, if I can just die, you know, and go to heaven, then all of a sudden I'm going to experience the stuff that you teach. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that you won't, but I'm simply saying this. I'd rather experience it here Amen. in the lovely yeah. here and now. Yeah. Yes, when people die, God receives their spirit and they're in that spiritual dimension. I understand all that. But we can experience heaven while we're right here. On earth, we don't have to wait Amen. to die someday Hallelujah. and to go to heaven, wherever heaven is, <laughs> and experience these things that we're desiring to experience here. So, I said all that to say this. Psalm 1-1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh, not in the counsel of the left side, the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the what does it say? Seed of the scornful. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that the way it says it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of that is talking about the left side, folks. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man that doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. You could say that's your left side. Mm -hmm. Or as it says, let me go back and read that whole verse again. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the council, and I could say it this way, of the left side nor stands in the way of the left side, nor sitteth in the seat of the left side. All of that can be applied to our left side. So blessed is the man, now I want to get to this point, that walketh. Now how do we walk? Well, we walk with two feet. So what is this talking about? This is talking about blessed is the man or woman that continually moves on in the spirit and you know that when they would talk about in the Old Testament, I think it's in Song of Solomon, in different places with Abraham, they built tents. Why did they live in tents? Because they could collapse them quickly because they were always on the move. See, So this is talking, blessed is the man that walketh. When we look at this in the positive way, as the positive practice, it's the people that are on the move spiritually. And, you know, I kind of almost hate to say this, but because it's been so abused out there, there is a progressive Christianity. Absolutely. Where people are progressing. Absolutely. Now, we want to progress, and we're progressing, and we're on the move spiritually. Yes. But not so much that we want to just swallow anything. Yeah. We want to receive the truth. Yes. Now, another word that we could get into and this is the Greek word for blessed, is eulogy, where we get the word eulogy. It's elogio, and it's where we get eulogy. And a eulogy, listen, is simply kind words spoken over someone that has died. And because our Father always spoke a good word over us from before the foundation of the world, that word still holds. Yes, yes. It echoes throughout heaven and earth. Therefore, we have died to what? What have we died to? An old awareness. Yes. Jesus' crucifixion, his death and his burial exposed the lies. The veil was rent, remember? So we could see face to face. And so what is this eulogy? Well, we had a death where our old awareness was concerned because our Father <coughs> spoke good words and kind words over us from before the foundation of the world before we even came here. 
In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, where it says, He hath, past tense, blessed us with all spiritual blessing in Christ. That word blessed is also eulogy. In other words, he has spoken a good word from before the foundation over us. He didn't see the end from the beginning in that he saw what all was going to befall us negatively. No. He spoke a good word over us at what? At the from before time, but then at the death of the old awareness that we had, thinking we were dual, thinking we were separate from the Father, that good word then came forth within us. And we were able then to see face to face. We were able then to see what he spoke over us from before time. And we were able then to experience subjectively what he spoke over us from before time. So verse 1 again. Blessed is the man that walketh, or is on the move. Okay, he's on the move. But he's not walking in the counsel of the left side, the ungodly, of mere intellect, reason, or logic, nor standeth in the way of sinners. What would the meaning of a sinner be? It would just be someone who is dead in Christ. Mm -hmm. What is a dead in Christ? You have the dead in Christ, the asleep in Christ, and those who are alive and remain for his full coming here. So the dead in Christ would be those that Christ, they're in Christ, but they don't have a clue. Yeah. They don't know that whatsoever. And then he goes on to say, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, the scornful are those who mock the truth. They're mockers of truth. And the only thing that would mock truth would be our left side. Right. Yes. The only thing that would mock or make fun of someone that is speaking the truth would be that individual's left side. So you have the word ungodly here in verse 1. You have the word sinners. You have the word scornful here in verse 1. And let me just say this. No one is ungodly. Amen. So what is he talking about there? The counsel of the ungodly. A person can appear ungodly. Yeah, absolutely. It's only an appearance. Yep. Do you know that people can appear ungodly good just as well as appear ungodly <laughs> evil? Yeah. Why? Because simply living from the left side. Well, come on now. There is an external good right on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But you know what? There's an internal good on the tree of life, yes. which is represented again by our right side. Yes. So it's important that we understand which tree are we going to eat of? Tree of knowledge of good and evil in and of itself? Or are we going to partake of our Christ's mind, the tree of life that abides on the inside of us and bear fruit that remains as opposed to fruit that's here today and gone tomorrow? It's very simple, right? So are you kind of hearing Psalm 23 in this? Yeah, yes, yeah. Same thing we had last week. Six verses in Psalm 23, six in Psalm 1. Now, look at verse 2. But his delight. Now we're getting into the practice, but the positive side of the practice. Okay? Verse 1 was the negative side of the practice. Verse 2 is more specifically now the positive side of the practice. Then we're going to talk about power, purification, and permanence. So verse 2, but his delight, in other words, the one that does not live from the left side of the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, his delight, notice, is in the law of the Lord, or I could say the right side. Yes. Is our delight in the right side? Yes. Drawing from the right side, yielding the left, drawing from the right side so the two can become subjectively one. And then it goes on to say, and in his law, or in his word, or in the Christ's mind, doth he meditate day and night. And notice there, not just the day, but also the night. You know, David said he specifically liked to meditate when he was laying upon his bed. So in the night. And we've talked about the best time to meditate is when it's dark. Because that gets the pineal to produce the melatonin which kills cancer cells, which balances the circadian rhythm, which does a whole lot of good medicinal things for us, the pineal gland does. So when you are meditating in the, a dark room, the pineal slowly begins to open up and produces that melatonin, which we need for more than just the ability to sleep at night, but we need it for, it reverses the aging process. That's the one I like the best. Yes. <laughs> reverses the aging process. Amen. Balances the circadian rhythm. Causes you to sleep real well that night. 
because of the melatonin that's produced. And doctors, <laughs> medical science is finding out more and more about the pineal than they've ever known before. About 50 years ago, the only good that the pineal was to medical doctors was if someone had brain smelling, uh, swelling, did I say smelling? Yes. Brain swelling, they could take a, a scan and they could see if the pineal was leaning you know, one way or, or the other and detect whether there was brain swelling. Mm. Yeah, actually. Wow. Now, as I said, we have four results here. The practice, verse one, the negative side. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't walk by the left side. All three of those have to do with the left side. And then we have the power, once we get to verse three, we'll see that. So we have the practice, negative and positive. We have the power in <coughs> verse two, uh, or verse three, excuse me. And then we have in verses four and five, a purification. And then in verse six, the first part, we have permanency. So let's go to verse three now, let's read this. And this has to do with the power. It says, and he, he who? Well, the one who yields the left to the right. What does he do? He joins the two together and marries the two together subjectively. And he, okay, shall be, when you draw out of the right side, the Christ line, as opposed to your intellect and reason the way you think it has to be or should be, then you join these two together. Heaven invades earth, okay? So verse 3 talks about that. And he shall be like a tree. Listen to that, planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, the words his season denote all seasons, mm -hmm. all seasons. And I could connect you to John chapter 15 where it talks about as we, the branch, abide in the vine, the Christ mind, then we bring forth, we bear continuing fruit. It's the same thing as fruit that remains. Right. Let's say that again. John 15 talks about the vine and the branch. Okay? He is the vine. We are the branch. This is us over here. He's the vine. So as we dwell in the vine, the Christ mind, as opposed to the intellect, the reason, the logic, the ego, the emotions, the five senses, then what happens is we bring forth, we bear this fruit that remains. And listen, where is the fruit? It's on the branch. Fruit doesn't grow on the vine when you're talking about a tree. It grows on the branch. You're the branch. And I remember saying this one time, I think it was on Dr. Bill's show, I said, the fruit, the best fruit, is the furthest out on the branch. <laughs> it's the, fur the furthest space out on the branch. See, I told you I was out there. Yeah. <laughs> We're all out on the limb, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Now, that's the power there. Let me read that again. Verse 3. And he shall be, he who, he who draws out of the Christ mind, by yielding this and joining the two together, and heaven invades earth, you, heaven invades earth, you, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall also not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So the leaf doesn't even wither, you know, like we have evergreen trees. They stay green all year yes. round. You're like an evergreen tree. Absolutely. Yes. And the evergreen tree speaks of life everlasting. Yes. Yes. It speaks yes. of immortality if you want to associate it with a tree. Always green. Always green. Always green. Always green. Remember we found out in Psalm 23, he leads me by green pastures, and I shared with you how that you can see green in the book of Revelation talking about Jesus, the emerald, which is green, and it's the astral part of you. Yeah. What is the astral part of you? Well, it's the right side. It's that invisible side. It's that part that is the, not the terrestrial, but the celestial that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You, you are a celestial being. Absolutely. You have a terrestrial body, yeah. an earth body, but it's still spirit slowed down to visibility. Sure. Don't let me get off on that. Now, <laughs> verses 4 and 5. Look at verses 4 and 5. And here we're getting into the purification. 
Some people would read this literally and say, oh, that means some people that are living on the left side, they're going to die. He's not talking about that whatsoever. God is not involved in that. He's involved in life. Amen. So look, the ungodly, even the good ungodly, according to appearances, those that are living from the left side, the ungodly, even the good ungodly from the left side, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, are not so. They're not so. The ungodly, listen, are not so. They're not like we read in verse 3, that are like trees planted by the rivers of living water and bring forth their fruit in his season, bring forth fruit that remains. The ungodly are not so, or those that live on the left side in and of itself are not so, but are like the chaff. And how many know chaff has no real substance? Mm -hmm. It's blown away very easily by the wind. Okay? Well, that's the truth. So those who live from the left side are like the chaff, then it goes on to say, which the wind driveth away. Yeah. Verse 5, therefore the ungodly, or those living from the left side, even ungodly good, according to appearance, mm -hmm. shall not stand in judgment. Now, what is judgment you're talking about? <clears throat> what is judgment talking about? Judgment, in one of the little John books, it talks about, as he is, so are we. But it talks, before it says, as he is, so are we in this world, it talks about the day of judgment. You need to know this in the day of judgment, but as he is, so are we in this world. <laughs> so what is it saying here, where it says, therefore the ungodly, those who live from the left side, shall not stand in judgment, what it's saying is they're going to go through a purification. Yeah. And we taught this in Revelation chapter 20. You have a first group, a first fruit that come into the experience of what we're teaching here. And then it says the rest of the dead, carnally, live not again until the thousand years are finished or until that first group of people come into the very fullness of what we're sharing here. Why? Because as Romans 8 says, all creation is on tiptoe looking for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why? Yes, that right. they might be delivered into the glorious liberty of the sons of God themselves. Right. So there's a first fruit company that are experiencing this now so that we can be used to bring the rest in. The yes, rest yes. of the dead must yes. be brought in. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 23. So let me read this again, verse 5. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand, or sh yeah, shall not stand in judgment. In other words, their, their stuff is going to be burned up. They're not going to be able to stand in judgment. Another way of saying that is we are the ones that judge the left side and decide whether that's wholesome or not and decide if we're going to yield it to the Christ mind. So you can add that to the mix as well. So those who live from the left side shall not stand in judgment. In other words, they're not going to stand with their stuff over here on the left side. Right. They're going to have to go through the purification of the fire of the word, okay? Right. Nor sinners, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous or the right side. In other words, you can't mix the two is what it's saying there. You can't mix the two. The two will not mix like oil and water right. will not mix unless you yield the left side. Then the two become one. That's right. And the Christ mind rules over the right. lower intellect, the lower reasoning, the lower logic and ego, the five senses and the emotions. So this is not talking about the ungodly shall not stand in judgment and, and, and in the congregation of the righteous. It's not talking about, well, you know, they're going to die. As it goes on to say in the next verse, that's not talking about it. It's not talking about people themselves perishing. It's talking about their ways perishing. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? It's talking about the left side yes. being yielded. And even lower thoughts than the left side, which, which we've talked about before. Even the low, Now, those thoughts will be destroyed in the fire, the lake of fire, in the fire of his word. Yeah. See? Thank God. Thank God. Those thoughts that are totally contrary, like... You know, if, for example, let's say you're going through a crisis maybe in your physical body and you hear this voice that says, well, you'll never be healed. Those things have to be destroyed. Yes. You're not yes. the fire. Absolutely. Yes. But when we're talking about intellect and reason and logic, God gave you those things. Yes. They're not going to be destroyed. You need yes. them. You need intellect. You need reason. You need logic. Yes. But it just oh. needs to be yielded. Yes. See, that's the, that's the big deal there. It has to be yielded. Now, verse 6. Verse 6, and this is a purification, verses 5 and 6. 
For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. And those who live by the right side, okay? Those who live by the right side, they consist of what? Permanent fruit that they're bearing. So the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly, or those that live by the left side, shall perish. Mm. Sounds like they're going to come to the end of their life, physically. No, it's not saying that at all. If you look at the allegory, and this is what we're after, the allegory. We're leaving the historicity and coming into the allegory. So what is this saying here? Simply it's saying that the left side has got to be purified and it's got to be, it does go through the fire of the word, not to destroy it, but to bring it to the place Absolutely. where it's yielded, yes. where it's yielded under the Christ mind. So that's it. There you have verses 1 through 6 of Psalm 1. You have the practice in verse 1, which is on the negative side, stand not in the counsel of the ungodly and so forth. And then in verse 2, you've got the practice on the positive side. He'll be like what? A tree. And then you've got the power. Then you've got the purification. And then in the last verse there, you have got the permanence that you will bring forth once the thoughts of the left side, the intellect and the reason and so forth, has been yielded to the Christ mind. Then you will bear, as John 15 says, fruit that remains. Uh, you know, I don't know how to say it any simpler than that. I don't know how to say it any simpler than that. It's very, very simple. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you some other scriptures. <clears throat> some of these I'll read, some you can turn to. But I want to give you some scriptures that will correlate with what we read here in Psalm 1 and also will correlate with what we read last week in Psalm 23. So if you have your Bible with you or your device, let's go to Psalm 6. You're not far from it. You're in Psalm 1, so quickly go to Psalm 6. Psalm 6, verse 5. There are a lot of scriptures that we can find that talk of the left side and the right side. I'm not just pulling this out of my hat somewhere. A lot of scriptures about the left and the right side. Now look what it says in Psalm 6 and verse 5. The foolish left-sided activity... Left-sided activity. Left activity in and of itself right. shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all works of iniquity. Uh -oh. oh, that sounds kind of scary there. Uh -oh. God hates all works of iniquity. Well, well iniquity simply means self-will. That's so good. Self-will uh -oh. is when you live merely by your intellect Shame. or by your reason or by your logic. I can figure this out. I've got a situation here, and bless God, I can figure it out on my own. I don't need spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't need the Christ mind. Mm -hmm. That's what that's saying there. Mm -hmm. The foolish. Okay. Oh, shall, that is Psalm 6, 5. Psalm mm -hmm. 6, verse 5. So that's not it? Mm -hmm. I must have wrote the wrong scripture down then. Okay. okay. So the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. I'll try to find it and okay. give it to you. Thou hatest all works of iniquity. What is that talking about? It's talking about us. We are the ones that need to hate all works of drawing out of our left side in and of itself. We need to. We need to hate that. Right? Yes. And realize, as long as we're drawing from the left side in and of itself, we can't bear fruit, especially fruit that remains. Continuing fruit, as John 15 talks about it. Let me give you another one. Ezekiel or Ecclesiastes, excuse me, 10 verse 2. And we are going to do some teaching in Ecclesiastes. So along with this one that I thought was in 6.5 that said, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all works of iniquity. It's simply, simply talking about the left side, living from the left side, as opposed to living from the right side. And the word iniquity simply is pointing us to the fact that self-will, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to figure this out, George. i got this problem, but I'm going to reason it out myself. No, we yield that self-will, that iniquity, and we draw from the Christ mind. Now, Ecclesiastes 10.2. A wise man's heart is at his right hand. Oh, wisdom is at the right, it's saying, okay? But a fool's heart is at his left. A fool's heart is at his left. The fool draws out of the left side continually. 
But the wise man draws out, or woman draws out, of the, of the right side of the Christ mind. Psalm 5-5 was where it was. Oh, Psalm 5-5. Five, five. Right. Okay, I had 6-5. Five. Psalm 5-5. Five, five. The foolish shall not stand in my sight. Of course we're not going to stand. We're not going to be standing in our Christ mind if we're drawing from the left side. See? We're going to be drawing from what? We're going to be standing in what? Self-will and equity. Doing our own thing. See, that's, what, that's all that scripture is talking about. And then Ecclesiastes 10, 2, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Now look at Psalm 13, 3. Hope I have this one right. Psalm 13, 3. Psalm 13, 3. Now, what we need to understand is life to us is different than life to God, our Father. Death to us is different yeah. than death to the Father. Yeah. When he looks at death, he's looking at, as Romans 8, 7 says, to be carnally mindful is death. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Life to him is the right side. Us draw, yielding and drawing from the right side. That's life to God. Absolutely. That's life to our Father. Hallelujah. And it needs to be for us. Is. You know? We have his mind, so yes. we can think the exact same way as Absolutely. the Father does. So Psalm 13, 3, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So what does this mean to lighten our eyes? I see it as us no longer viewing things strictly from the two eyes on our head. Right. Lighten my eyes, lift me up to the single eye. As yeah. Jesus said, if your eye be single, your whole body will be full, with light, full of light or filled with light. And then sleep, consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, light my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So what would the sleep of death be? If the lightning of the eyes is to be lifted up to the single eye, then what would the sleep of death be here? Lest I sleep the sleep of death, it would be being asleep in Christ. As Paul talked about, the dead in Christ, the sleep in Christ, and those who are alive and remain. So what is asleep in Christ? Asleep in Christ is being asleep in man-made traditions and doctrines of men. <laughs> That's what our Father considers as death. See? Romans 8, 7 again. To be carnally mindful is what? Death. That's the realm. That's how Father looks at, looks at death. Absolutely. And he looks at life as a people who are alive and remain yes. unto the coming the Lord. of the Lord. Not out here, splitting the eastern sky, coming back, dodging 747s, and landing in Kennedy Airport. No, not that at all. <laughs> That's not life to the Father. Life to the Father is his coming within us. Yes. As we go from realm to realm and yes. glory to yes. glory. Yes. 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 Now listen to this verse. In 1 Timothy 5, 6, it's talking about this woman who lives in pleasure and is dead while she liveth. Yep, that's what it says. And then you can look at the ten virgins. They were all asleep mm -hmm. before they were awakened. And then five of them stayed pretty much asleep. Yep. And never did come in to the joining, you see. Well, what, was that, what is that talking about, the virgins? The five wives that went into the marriage and the other that were not allowed to go in. It's simply talking about the sides they were joining. The light, the lamp, the light that they had. Five were drawing out of the Christ mind and were watchful. Five were not. They were not drawing out of there. They ran out of oil. Yeah, that Wanted way. to borrow from someone else. Listen, I could preach on that too. Oh, come on! <laughs> yeah, babe. What would I say about that? Yeah. You, you ain't going to get it from nobody, That's including right. me. That's right. That's right. You're not going to get it from anyone, including That's myself. Right. You get it. Now, I can help you and encourage yes, you, you to can. desire these things, but it's got to be something that's quickened yes. within you, yes. individually, between you and the Father right. within. Yes. Psalm 17 and verse 9 says, From the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who can pass me about. Now, someone says, well, I've got some enemies out here, some people that really, really hate me. No, your real enemies are the left side yeah. in and of itself. Again, nothing wrong with the left side, right. but when you are drawing, that's your enemy. Yep. If, when you're living by intellect and reason and logic and emotions and five senses, right. in and of themselves, 
they become, those are your real enemies. Yes. Yes. See, because you're not yielding them. Yep. And that's all that it's saying there in Psalm 17. Look at Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verses 3 and 5. Psalm 18, verses 3 through 5. See, because the, the answer to these challenges is his appearing in the form of our Christ mind. Mm -hmm. See, when you yield the left side mm -hmm. and you draw out of your Christ mind, that's the appearing of the Lord. Absolutely. That's an appearing of the Lord. There's three basic, there's more than three, but there's three Greek words that I use for coming, right. manifestation, and appearing. Right. It's epiphania. He's outshining out yes. of us. When we join the two, he shines out of us. Then there's apocalypse. He's unveiled out of us when we join the two together subjectively. And then there's the perusia. We are his presence. Absolutely. See, when the two become one, we here, our earth, this is earth too, our earth. And of course, earth in, the, earth in the scripture talks many times about what? Our bodies. Earth, our bodies. See? So our bodies exude the glory of the Lord. Absolutely. Right? Manifest the glory of the Lord. When? When the two become one. Yes. When the two become one. So Psalm 18, 3 through 5, 3 through 5, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. How? By calling on the Lord. By desiring to live out of the right side. And when contrary thoughts come, or you want to figure things out yourself, calling on the Lord is drawing from the Christ mind. Okay? So I'll call upon the Lord. I'll call upon my Christ mind. I'll yield the left to my Christ mind, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compass me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell, verse 5, come past me about. The snares of death prevented me. And again, what is this talking about? Yes, David had some men that were his enemies out here. But when we move beyond the historicity and take this allegorically, the enemies that come past us are just our left side that want to rule. Right. Rather than our Christ ruling. Absolutely. That's what it's talking about there. The ungodly men are just simply... The lower thoughts. We could talk about that. We'll talk about that more a little later on. So people that act ungodly only do what they do because of who they think they are and who they don't realize that they are. Say that again. People who sin, have sins, we need to understand this, and you all do. Sin is mistaken identity. Right. But people who act ungodly in the appearance realm or have sins in the appearance realm only do it from a lack of understanding yes. of yes. their identity. Yes. It's, just the, it's just the manifestation. Just like Adam, he was told, don't partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What did he do? And God had told him, you're made in my image and after my likeness. What did he do? He said, in his mind, he said, Oh, I'm not in God's image yes. and likeness. I need to do something to be like yeah. God. So that was sin. That was mistaken identity. Right. So then what did he do? He committed then sins by partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Simply because he did not retain who God had told them that they were. Right. Made after the image and the likeness of God. So to me, the worst thing that Adam did was when he said and thought in his consciousness yes. from his left side, I need to do something to be like God. Yeah. When God already told him, you're in my image and after my likeness. So because he had that mistaken identity and he embraced that mistaken identity from his left side, then he partook. And that, that you could say was sins, plural. He partook of what God told him not to partake of. Behavior. Now, behavior, yes. Go back to Psalm 30. Psalm 30. Verses 3 and 9. Psalm 30, verses 3 and 9. And in Psalm 30, verses 3 and 9, this is a prayer of David, actually. And it was at the dedication of David's house. And it denotes merely living and focusing on the natural rather than the spiritual. How many know we have a lot of good people out here that are just living a natural life, but they're good people? For sure. But the wrong good, not the intrinsic good. 
not the tree of life good that comes from within. Good from the outside, from the external realm. A lot of good people out here, That's right. right? So when we are drawing out of the mere intellect and reason and the five senses and the emotions, that constitutes just living a natural life <coughs> as opposed to a spiritual life, <coughs> right? So David's prayer here in Psalm 30 and verse 3 is, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul. Notice, not my body. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul, my heart awareness, from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. In other words, his heart awareness was quickened. And what will that quickening and conception do in our heart awareness? It'll keep us from going down to the pit of carnality and doing our own thing. Living by the intellect, living by the reasoning, living by the logic, living by the five senses, whatever my five senses tell me. And that was Eve's problem. Instead of viewing things out of her single eye, what did she do? She saw that with the two eyes in her head that the food looked good, looked good or man. the fruit looked good for food, and she desired it because it was something that she saw, five senses, that right. looked good, looked and, good. She par and she thought it was good, had to be good to taste because it looked so good, and she partook of that oh. fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as a result, death entered immediately because she partook of death. Instead of yielding. Mm, so good. Instead of yielding the left side. Wow. So, O Lord, verse 3 of Psalm 30, thou hast brought up my soul, not my body, it's talking about the awareness, from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. So, in other words, our prayer should be, Lord, keep us from going down to death, the death of the left side. Keep us, O oh Lord, from going down to the pit of the lower thoughts, of trying to figure it out ourselves, yeah. doing it on our own. Verse 9, what profit is there in my blood or in my life when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? So David is asking what good is his life if he gets caught up in a consciousness of death and living by the left side? That's what he's asking there. Because you know what? There's no voice. It says, shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? There's no true voice when you're living from the left side in the pit, in carnality. You don't have the voice of God speaking no, you don't. out of your mouth. But you're That's speaking it. from the pit. You're speaking from the death. You're speaking yes. from the left side. I want to speak from the right side. Yes. Because you know what? There's only one voice. There's only one voice. Any other voice has no power, but we give it power by thinking it have, has yes, a power. We give it a power stuff. by drawing out of the left side. Only one voice, folks. <laughs> one voice. Like there's only one spirit, one body, one power. There's only one voice. Oh, there's many voices out here. Oh, there's said. a lot of voices. But guess what? They have no real power no, in and of themselves. And religion has given those voices out here power. Yep when they absolutely have no power whatsoever. No stinking power whatsoever. Mm. Except what people give it in religiosity. So if we want to speak with the voice as it says here in verse 9, what does it profit? If I go down to the pit, if my life, my blood or my life shall go down to the pit, shall the dust praise thee? In other words, can I speak with the one voice if I go down to the pit of the left side in and of itself? This making any sense? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Psalm 33, 19. Psalm 33 and verse 19 then gives us a prayer for those who want to find their true life. How many of you want to find your true life? Yes. And it's also a prayer when we begin to realize God's purpose for our life, and it will also be our meditation as well. Psalm 33, verse 19. Psalm 33, verse 19. To deliver their soul. Heart awareness, yes. I could say. Yeah. Okay? To deliver their heart awareness. That's the feminine principle. Right? The feminine principle is our left side. The masculine principle is our Christ mind. So we want to live 
We want to yield. You know, like it says, the woman shall keep silent in the church. Well, the woman should keep silent in the church, even in the man. <laughs> because what that means is the woman, the left side, is speaking. Yes. yes. See, And that's why Paul said that the wife must submit to the husband. That's not something in the natural. It's talking about the feminine principle yielding to the, our husband Christ. That's what it's talking about there. So it says here in Psalm 33, 19, to deliver their soul from death, or lower thinking, and to keep them alive in famine. Hello. So what is that telling us? In other words, even when there's a famine for the word, and I will tell you there's a famine yes. for the word today. Yes. There is a famine for the word today. Absolutely. Very few people are speaking the truth. Right. That's going to give you back yes. your life. Yes. Yes. So even in the midst of famine, it's saying here, yes. let me read it again, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. <coughs> even in the midst of the famine yes. of religiosity today and what it's preaching and teaching, that is we good. can still yes. yield the left, yes. the feminine to the masculine. We can it's still so join good. the two together. No matter how loud religiosity is yes. speaking out yes. there, yep. stuff, right. man-made traditions and doctrines that will not give us back our life. Right. No matter how strongly they're trying to hold on to, after the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 6 says, I want you to leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ, baptism and faith toward God and all these things that are listed there, even though religion is trying to keep those things, and we can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. We can hear it. We don't have to pay any mind to it. No, we we can still do the work of yielding Absolutely. the feminine to the masculine. Psalm 49, 15. Psalm 49, and verse 15. And we'll see here that these writers were not concerned about heaven over hell. You know, salvation is not about escaping hell and making heaven. Salvation means deliverance and health. It has nothing. Heaven, the majority of the church today believe I've got to get saved. So when I die, I miss hell and go to heaven. Yep. Salvation is not that whatsoever. Salvation is about living here. Mm -hmm. What salvation means, it's sozo, soteria. Do you need healing after you've died and gone to heaven? No. Do you need deliverance? Do you need the things that salvation says? Absolutely not. So salvation is not a heaven-hell issue. It's a living in the lovely here and now issue. Yes. It's for us today. Yeah. Yes. And this is what he's saying here, that we can see that these writers are not concerned about heaven over hell or good over evil, but what they're concerned about is life instead of death. Right. Life, right side instead of death, left, yes. left side in and of itself. So look what it says there, Psalm 49, 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Yes. Left side. Thank God. Wow. For he shall receive me. Yes. Now, what is the he shall receive me? Your womb, your virgin consciousness, just like every woman was made to bear children. Your womb was made by God to bear fruit. Yes. And so when we yield our woman to our masculine, when we do that, then what we're doing is what it says here in Psalm 49, 15. God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. When you yield the left side, he receives that. Yes. The he, the realm of spirit, the Christ mind, receives that. And the two come together, and yeah. they intercourse one with another, right. and they bear what? See what happens. Paul said there's neither male nor female. Right. So once the two become one, what is it? It's not male, and it's not female. <laughs> it just is. Jesus. It's Christ. Right, yes. It's just Christ. You, you are bearing Christ. That's so good. Isn't that good? Yes. Yeah, so. Now, Psalm 56 <coughs> and verse 13, if you look at that one, Psalm 56 and verse 13. So God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive it. <coughs> now, let me say something about that. That almost sounds like, because Paul never did say that God was going to cause you to renew your mind. No, he said you renew it. God's not going to do this for us. 
as we yield to the Christ within us, then yes, it's done. But you know what? It's still us doing it. In Philippians 4, when he tells us what to think on, think on the things that are of a good report, just, lovely, and so forth. God's not going to make you do that. Right. True. You and I have to do that. Yes. You see? You and I have to do it. So the beginning of that in Psalm 49, 15, where it says, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Yes, once we have yielded it, then our Christ mind does deliver us from the death. That's in the left side. Right? Yes. Now, Psalm 56, 13. Listen to this. I love this. For thou, being what? Our Christ mind, has delivered my soul, what? Feminine side, from death, the death of what? The death of the carnal thoughts. Yes. Will not thou deliver my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living? In other words, how many times can our Christ mind deliver us from death? As often as is needed. <laughs> but it's after we yield, see? Yes. And listen, our awareness is a projector. We've, we've talked about that in this whole series. Our awareness, your, your feminine part is what? A projector, just like a, a woman's womb when she gets pregnant. She goes into labor about nine months later, and what does she do? She projects that baby out, that infant out. Well, listen, our feminine part, this is the womb of God, the Father. Yes. Our feminine part does the same thing. It's a projector, as a man thinks, in his heart awareness. So is he. That will be his experience. So the same way with us. When we sow the seed thoughts of the Christ mind into our womb, our feminine part, there's going to be a projection of that into the experience of our lives. Whatever we sow here is going to be experienced in our life. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he or so will be his experience. See, and it's important for us to understand God's not doing this for us, but once we yield, yes, then it's him in us and as us doing it. Mm -hmm. See, and we need to get that, you know, that understanding. So Psalm 56, 13 again, For thou hast delivered my soul, my feminine side, from death, the death of what? Carnal thoughts, or mere intellect, or mere reasoning, or mere logic. Wilt thou, wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling? So in other words, what it is saying is, when we yield the carnal thoughts, that death, to the life of Christ, our Christ mind, it's going to do something where our feet are concerned, where our walk is concerned. Our walk changes completely. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living. I think there's another scripture that talks about living in the land, land of, the living, of the living, the land of the living. So once this here becomes joined, the feminine with the masculine, it's going to alter our walk. Exactly what happened to Jacob when he saw God face. He was wrestling with the message, and he saw God face to face. Why? Because his pineal was activated. He named the place Peniel, right, which is a derivative of pineal, and his life was preserved. He walked in the, you could say, in the light of the living, in the understanding of life then. And that's exactly the same thing we see portrayed here in this particular verse in Psalm 56 and verse 13. Now, Psalm 88, look at Psalm 88. We're going to close here shortly. Psalm 88, verses 10 and 11. The writer here was meditating, and he was weighing this question. He was weighing out the question of what is, he was asking, what is real life? And what is mere existing? Do you know there's a difference? Of course we know there's a difference. A lot of people today in the church are just existing. Yep. And some barely existing. Yep. But there are some that are beginning to experience what real life is, and they're getting their life back. Yes. And you see, if we would ever have a, a, a proper framework for subjectively experiencing our Father, then we'll have enough understanding to weigh out the difference between existence and real life. And this is the question that is being asked here in Psalm 88, verses 10 and 11. Look what it says there. Psalm 88, 10 and 11. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? 
Selah, think about it. Yeah. Think about it. Shall thy loving kindness, verse 11, be declared in the grave? Or thy faithfulness in destruction? So he's asking the question. Can I praise you if I'm living strictly on the left side in and of itself? Shall thy loving kindness be declared when I'm living in death over here on the left side? Is that real life? That's the question he's asking here. Or is that just existence? Well, I'm here to tell you it's just existing. It's just existing. Real life is when we join the two together by yielding the left to the right. And it's very important for us to, to understand that. Now, Psalm 102, I think this is maybe almost the last one. Psalm 102, verses 18 through 20. Psalm 102, verses 18 through 20. So, in order for us to experience what I'm talking about here, we have to get to the place to where we are not satisfied with just existing. Right? We want to experience life. And listen, we already objectively have life through and through. 2 Thessalonians 5.23 in the Amplified says, we have been sanctified. Some synonyms for sanctified are deified, anointed, and then it says where? Through and through in the Amplified, spirit, soul, and body. So objectively, we already have all of this. Subjectively, are we walking in it? Absolutely not. And once we come to the place to where we're sick and tired of just existing, which many, many are, especially in religiosity today, and when we realize what real life really is and what is real life, it's not just living in our objective reality, but it is desiring to subjectively walk in this that we're talking about. And then you will experience the real life. Then you'll get your life back. Yes. And you'll be able to walk life. in that abundant life. Absolutely. Now, Psalm 102, 18 through 20. This shall be written for the generation to come. Now, listen to this. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Now, the word created there, some people get really confused on this. The word created means to be cut down for a formative process. Now, what does that mean? It means to bring out of the invisible and evolve into the visible. And that's what happened to us. We were in God from before the foundation in the invisible realm. And then God wanted the people on the earth to show forth his glory. Otherwise, no one would have seen his glory. So he brought us forth. We were cut down for a formative process and that's not anything bad. It just simply means we were brought out of the invisible realm and brought down into visibility. Now, look at this here. Verses 19 and 20, 19 and 20 of Psalm 102 says, For he hath looked down from the height of the sanctuary, that's us, from heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Verse 20, To hear the groaning of the prisoners to loose them that are appointed unto death. Well, that sounds like God appointed some unto death, and he, you know, he predestined some to life, and he predestined some to death. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We were appointed only, and we were given the blessing only of the things of the kingdom. Like he told Jeremiah, he told him, I know the plans I have for you, right. they're for good and not for evil. Right. So this is what this is talking about. To hear, verse 20, the groaning of the prisoners to loose those that are appointed to death. In other words, he has a first fruit people that are going to go forth and declare this message to those that are appointed for religiosity. But who appointed them? Man appointed them. Man appointed them for death. Man appointed them for religiosity. And so God has a people, a first fruit people today, not some elite group that are better than anyone else. No, this will bring humility to your humility. life quicker than anything else yes, will. Because I'll guarantee you, you'll get a lot of people yes. saying you're the cult and you're this and you're that. Yes. And, it, you know, it does humble you. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there are people today that God has in the earth that are bringing forth a message, yes. showing them how they can draw out of their own well and how that which religion has appointed unto death for them will be cut short. 
and will be cut out of their lives. That's all that's saying there. Let me read that again. Let me, let me go back and read that in Psalm 102, verses 18 through 20. This shall be written for the generation to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. In other words, the people that know that they came out of the invisible realm, they are spirits slowed down to visibility, as 2 Thessalonians 5.23 says in the Amplified, that they are anointed and they are deified and they are set apart in spirit and soul and body. Those are the people that are the first fruit. And then verse 19, for he has looked down from the height of the sanctuary. You're his sanctuary. Yeah. In you, he's looking down and seeing those people that are in the pit and in the grave of carnality. Oh and so to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed unto death, religion has appointed those people unto death, and we're here to loose them Man. into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Shit. As Romans 8, 23 says. Let my people go. Oh, yeah. my Let God. my people go. Absolutely. Jeez. Absolutely. Ooh. That's the message. Man. So good. Psalm 1, again, in closing, is an observation rather than a command. Wow. It's looking, yeah. it's reading that psalm and seeing what will happen as a result of those. And let me go back there and read that first verse once again. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the left side, nor standeth in the way of the left side, nor sitteth in the seat of the left side, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Yeah. He shall be like a tree. Like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water. That's right. His leaf shall not wither. Not wither. He'll be like the evergreen. evergreen. that speaks of everlasting life. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper simply because he's joined the masculine and the feminine together. Heaven has invaded earth. That's right. And we are experiencing that for which we were brought here in the first place for. That's right. So Psalm 1 is not a command. It's an observation. Blessed is the one who sees this and delights in the law of the Lord. And listen, when you truly delight in it, your whole life will be consumed. Absolutely. You'll eat it. You'll drink it. That's right. You'll sleep it. As Job said, I desire this more than my necessary food. It'll consume you. It'll consume you. And once it consumes you and you begin to live this, you will experience yes. fruit that remains Absolutely. rather than fruit that's here today and gone yes. tomorrow when you're trying to fig figure things out from the left side. So I encourage everyone yes. tonight. We're going to look at some more psalms. I'm encouraging everyone tonight to just simply realize you have a masculine principle in you and you have a feminine principle in you. The masculine principle is your Christ mind. The feminine principle is you. It's your emotions. It's your five senses. It's your intellect. It's your reason. It's your logic. You can even say it's your ego. And God does not want us. Father does not want us living out of that. And it's not so much Father doesn't want us living out of that. We don't want to live out of That's that right. because we want to be successful yeah. and prosperous and have fruit, bear fruet that remains. So, so that's Psalm 1. Yes. Psalm 23, Psalm 1, both have six verses, and they're both saying the same thing. Yes. In different words and in different ways. Wow. And let me say, from Genesis to Revelation, if you're looking at the scriptures rather than strictly from historicity, but you're moving into allegory. What does allegory mean? You see how those stories apply to you personally yes. and how you can walk in them. Jesus different. always spoke in parables. He never taught any other way but in parables. What is a parable? Well, you can read the story literally, but then if you're going to really get the parable, you have to see how it points to your life, just like the allegory. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? What did Jesus say about those who get the parable? Yes. And understand that it's <laughs> pertaining to them, not some story back thousands of years ago. Right. He said, if you are dwelling on the inside, you'll get it. You'll get it. Those without can't get it. Can't get it. It'll stay with the parable itself, the story yes, itself. But it. those who are dwelling on the inside, what, what is the key? Yes. Luke eleven fifty two. The key of knowledge, yes. the key of understanding is what? Turning within. Mm -hmm. He said, woe unto you lawyers. Yeah. Those who study the scriptures. Yeah. You don't turn within yourself, and you hinder those that want to turn within. And he said, turning within is the key of knowledge, just the key of understanding. Yes. 
How do we turn within? Well, Jesus said it very plainly. Go into the closet and shut the door. Go into yourself through meditation and shut out all of the appearance right out here. That's right. And take no thought. Take no thought of what? That's right. Of the Lord. Only take thought right. of the higher consciousness. It's a beautiful place. Of the higher thoughts. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful it's place. It's the place we are and it's the oh. place we want to be. Paradise. Huh? It's the place we are objectively. Because yes, yes. these two are already one. Yes, ma'am. But we want to walk it out. We want to subjectively experience this. And it's only going to come. It's very practical. It'll only come as we learn to take what we think mm -hmm. yep. in the Lord and yield it to the Christ. Right. Don't try to figure stuff out by yourself. <laughs> it doesn't work. doesn't work. It doesn't work when you try to figure it out by yourself. But you'll experience life and that more abundantly. Absolutely. Once we learn to yield. And that's the key word is yielding the left to the right. Father, we thank you. Yes. For who you are. Yes, Lord. Who you are in us. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for our spirit that is quickening, conceiving this word within our heart awareness that we can walk it and not just be satisfied with the objective reality, but desire the subjective experience. Yes. Thank you for the word. Thank you for your life. Thank you that your death exposed the lies that we'd embraced in religiosity. Yes. And thank you that your resurrection is the discovery of spiritual truth. Yes. And thank you that we're discovering it. Right. And we bless you and we honor you. Thank you for this body here tonight. Each and every one of us, no exceptions, each and every one of us will experience this yes. and will walk in this. In the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you.